It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Mrs. Rebecca Carroll, radio host, author, founder of HeartStrong Faith. Rebecca Carroll is, in order of importance, please listen carefully, a joyful Jesus follower, wife to Mike, who is here with us today, mother to Caitlin and Nick, morning show co-host in Dallas-Fort Worth on 90.9 KCBI, conference speaker, and an author. She also hosts Honest Conversations, looking at tough topics through a biblical lens podcast. Rebecca began her broadcasting career in country music in 1998, because I can just see you in boots. In 2011, she moved to Christian radio station, 90.9 KCBI, and in 2016, founded HeartStrong Faith, the women's ministry events branch of KCBI. Rebecca is also working toward her THM at Dallas Theological Seminary. So would you please join me in welcoming to chapel today, Rebecca Carroll. You can't tell, but I'm smiling at you. I really am. Thank you so much for coming today. I know it's just kind of a, a strange new world, isn't it? We're okay. We're fine. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I just, uh, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this time where we get to come together and pause and remember who you are and what you have called us to. And so speak to us today, Lord, please. Please, Lord, we need you so much. Remind us of who you are, no, who we are in you and who you are and what you have called us to. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I will be honest with you, I am considering it a win today that I made it here with no stains. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I think God lets things happen to me so that you will feel better about your life. I did speak at a conference last weekend. I had the opportunity to teach twice, and it was not even 10 full minutes before I went up onto the stage to teach that I uh, picked up my cup of coffee that was nice and piping hot, steaming. I had just prepared it, and you know how that first sip is always the best sip. And I went to take that big sip, and the only thing I had forgotten to do was fasten the lid on. I know. Now, fortunately, I was in a beige sweater, which is how I like my coffee, beige. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was in a very light shade of pants, and there was nothing I can do. Now, my sweet husband, I was texting furiously with my sweet husband, I did run a new pair of pants up, but not in time for me to uh, not in time for me to change before that first 45-minute session. So whatever you do today, you can feel better about yourself because you did not get up in front of a crowd and teach with a giant coffee stain all the way down your leg. You are welcome for that. You're welcome. <laughs> So every summer, my family and I, we go to Port Aransas down on the Texas coast, and we take <clears throat> about two weeks, which I need <laughs> by the end of the summer. I know you all feel the same way. And we take about two weeks, and this is my chance to just <sighs> let my brain kind of melt and just not read any books with big words. Anybody want to nod or amen to that, right? Okay, no big word, nothing over three syllables. And so I needed some light beach reading. And uh, so I decided that I would read a book that many people had recommended to me because I wanted something just light. Anyone here ever read Spirit of the Rainforest? <laughs> I wouldn't call it light. However, it is a great 
great book. I mean, it's, it's very heavy in some places, but I, I couldn't put it down. It's written by March, Mark Ritchie. Uh, Spirit of the Rainforest is about one of the more mis mysterious people groups there are in the world. This would be the Yanomamo Indian tribes of the Amazon. And I will tell you in full disclosure, because in radio, if you can't fix it, you feature it. I have never actually heard Yanomamo pronounced out loud before, only in my head as I have read it. So I might be pronouncing this wrong. And if I am, I just want to call that out and apologize already. But uh, Mark Ritchie describes them as small, rarely over five feet tall, and with the speed, strength, and agility of a jungle cat. Their women are known to carry their full body weight up and down jungle trails that would wear out the toughest Ironman triathletes. To quote Ritchie again, the men can call, track, and shoot anything that breathes in a jungle that is hostile enough to kill even a trained survivalist. The Yanomamo people are also notorious for their violence toward each other. The tribes typically do not get along, and so they are always at war with each other. And the women, in particular, are subject to terrible brutality. Now, the author writes this book from the perspective of one of the, um, one of the Indians. His name is Jungle Man, and he is a powerful and respected shaman. In other words, he is a spirit man. And one of the things you need to know about the Yanomamu people is that they are very spirit centric. So their lives revolve around the spirit world, and much of their wars even take place in the spirit realm before they ever take place in the physical realm. Now, one shaman, his name is Davi Kapanawa. He's not in the book, but he did allow himself to be interviewed for another publication. He says only those who know the spirits can see them because the spirits are very small and bright like light. There are many spirits, thousands of them them like light, like stars. They are beautiful and they dance very beautifully and sing differently. Now here's something else I found interesting. Um, their dwellings are called shabonos and it's a, a giant circular dwelling, but think of a donut. It's uh, open in the middle and so they sleep in hammocks. They hang their hammocks back underneath the covered part, but then they do all of their communal living in the center where it's uncovered. And that is not the only way way the word shabono is used. It's also used to describe the place they invite their spirits into. Isn't that interesting? When a shaman finds a spirit it likes, what he does is he invites it in to the shabono in his chest, and he can have as many spirits as he wants. Now, there are two Yanomamo Indians in particular that I'd like to introduce you uh, to today. Their names are Shoefoot and Spear. Now, Shoefoot and Spear are powerful warriors, well-known, and they also commune with the spirits, which is done by smoking a black powder called Ibin that's made from grinding up various roots and barks. Now, while the shaman have many, many spirits, there is one spirit in particular that has a bit of a reputation. He is known as Yaiwana Naba Lewa. The Yanomamo Indians call him the great spirit, the most powerful spirit. Guess who hates this spirit? All the other spirits. All the other spirits warned the Yanomamo Indians to stay as far away from the great spirit, the powerful spirit, as they possibly can. Now, I want to read to you an exchange out of the book that takes place between Shoefoot and Spear after they have spent a good deal of time with some Christian missionaries. Now, Shoefoot and Spear have been listening to the missionaries. They call them Nabas, N-A-B-A. And the Nabas have been telling them about this great spirit, the powerful spirit, who is, spoiler alert, Yaiwana Naba Blewa. All right? Now, they are intrigued because this spirit sounds so wonderful, but the Nabas also have a lot of things that they want that could help them. For instance, clothes. The Yanomamo Indians during this time period did not wear clothes. They also had tools they could use, such as fishing rods with actual hooks and pots and pans and things like that. Every night for many moons, Spear and Shoefoot had the same talk. They both wanted the new spirit. 
Everything they say about him is so wonderful, Shufoot said. Do you really think a spirit could be so wonderful? No, I don't either. They talk about love and being kind and so many things that seem so nice. If the Naba's spirit cares so much about us, Spear asked, staring at the roof, why don't the Nabas care about us? If this spirit wants our life to be better, why don't they? Have you wondered that? It's the only thing I've ever wondered, Shufoot answered. They never share anything with us. My boy asked them for a hook and fish line today, and they wouldn't share anything with him. And they never share the meat they get with their guns, even when, they help, even when we help them get it. And they sat in silence for a while. So the Nabas, the missionaries, came in the name of Jesus, and they had taken enough time to learn about the ways and the language of the Yanomamo tribes in order to be able to present the gospel to them in a manner that made sense to them. And what breaks my heart about this narrative is you can see just in this exchange how ready the Yanomamo people are to receive this spirit. Like, they wanted him. They wanted him. And as shoe, foot, and spear continue in their dialogue, they talk about how wonderful this spirit sounds. They want the way of peace. I already told you that the Yanomama were in a constant state of war with each other. And so what that would look like is one tribe would go in the middle of the night and it would be an all out slaughter. And then they would go back and they would celebrate for about a minute. And then the fear would creep in. And then they started living in terror, waiting for retribution. These guys, these, this, these tribes were miserable and they were tired and they wanted out. But as much as they wanted a new life, they also had an honor code. What I found interesting about the Yanomamo is that generosity is their highest ideal. If someone needed something, without exception, you gave it. In fact, the hunter that brought in a great catch, he actually never got to eat his kill. He graciously, in a great statement of generosity, gave it to everyone else, knowing that the next person who made a kill would come along and he would share with him. And so to withhold generosity to the Yanomamo people was the highest insult one could give. And this was scary. It meant that upon that person's death, upon the selfish person's death, they would be dragged into what they called the fiery pit. You know, we can say all the right things and we can post all the right memes and tweet all the right tweets. But if our behavior doesn't line up with what we are saying, no one believes us. Spear was nodding his agreement to everything Shufoot said. Then Spear decided something's wrong. When we live with our spirits, we become more like them. They dance, we dance. They steal and rape women, we steal and rape women. They fight and kill, we fight and kill. But these Nabas don't do what they say their spirit does. They say he's generous, but they're not. They say he's kind, but they're not. So shoe, foot, and spear kept their spirits. And every time I visited them, we blew a bean into our noses and danced together. That's tragic to me. And this exchange that I just read you begs a question of us, and that's this. Are we who we say he is? Are we who we say Jesus is? Because Spear made an incredibly insightful statement. When we live with our spirits, we become more like them. Are we who we say he is? We as human beings are actually among all of the mammals on earth. All of the species are um, 
the most hardwired to imitate. Now, other species will uh, imitate for reasons of survival only, but we take it way beyond that. Even as infants, between four and seven weeks of age, we start to imitate sounds and facial expressions, and it continues for the rest of our lives. What do we do when our kids are two, three, and four? We buy them toy cell phones and toy car keys and toy kitchens and toy battery-operated cars that they can drive around on the streets at age three, which is weird, but that's okay, that's okay. But why do we do that? It's because our kids want to imitate the us. They are imitating us because they want to be just like them. Now, I will tell you, for those of you who don't have kids yet, around the age of 12 or 13, they stop imitating you and they start imitating YouTubers, TikTokers, and their friends. And the litmus test for whether or not something is acceptable in the eyes of our children in our home is, are their friends doing it? Are their friends saying it? Are their friends wearing it? it. You know, most of you in this room are probably studying at Dallas Theological Seminary because someone you admired went here first. And that's okay. Like, this is how the Lord has wired us. He has ingrained this within us. But here's the result of that. You and I become what we behold. We become what we behold. We are always imitating the loudest voices in our lives. We are always imitating whatever it is we're watching. And I got to tell you something. Our behavior betrays the object of our beholding. I'm going to say it again because it is so very important. Our behavior betrays the object of our beholding. And we have to get this right. We have to get this right because the world is watching the church. If you brought your Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 is the point in John's gospel where the scene pivots. Up until this point, Jesus has been largely ministering to the crowds and the multitudes. And now all of a sudden it gets more intimate and Jesus is ministering to the twelve. Verse 1, just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that he should betray Jesus. Because Jesus knew that the Father had handed all things over to him, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he got up from the meal, removed his outer clothes, took a towel, and tied it around himself. He poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel he had wrapped around himself. Now, you've heard this story countless times. You've probably taught this story countless times. But I think it's worth revisiting today. So what's going on in this scene? Well, Jesus is preparing the 12 for two things, his death and their ministry. His death and their ministry. You see, the disciples were still confused. Things were not totally clicking with them just yet, and they did not yet understand that the kingdom of heaven is actually an inverted kingdom, an upside-down kingdom where the last shall be first and the first shall be last, where you die to self, take up your cross. Uh, Completely opposite, completely opposite of the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus' followers just had not wrapped their minds around this quite yet. In fact, and I will be honest, I enjoy this more than I should, and it's, it's a fault of mine, but I enjoy it more than I should. In Luke's account of the Last Supper, the disciples are still arguing about who is going to be the greatest, who is going to sit to his left, who is going to sit to his right. And something tells me they thought there was some glamour where they were headed, you know? They, they thought they had some privilege, some position, some power coming their way. But the Jews had been expecting a military Messiah who would come in and overthrow the government and restore Israel to a world power. And so that's probably why they were still fighting over who got to sit to the left and to the right of Jesus. Gosh, aren't you glad we don't do that? <laughs> we're so much better. We're just... We're just better than they were. Oh, boy. In the midst of all that posturing and bickering, though, what does it say Jesus did? 
He loved them. Ah, oh, he loved them. He loved them to the very end, and we'll come back to that. John also does something very deliberate here, and it feels to me almost like an interruption because you start verse one, and it's this beautiful, uh, just, you know, we're talking about Jesus, and he knows who he was and where he's going, and, and John goes out of his way to make sure that we understand that Judas was going to betray Jesus and that Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray Jesus. And Judas sat there and he let the Lord wash his feet, all the while knowing exactly what he was going to do. Oh, this is the scariest verse in scripture to me. I mean, it just is to walk that close with Jesus, like with Jesus, not some really inspirational leader who tells us about Jesus. He is with Jesus. I mean, he's eating the broken bread. He's eating the multiplied fish. He is sleeping under the stars with those late night conversations. He sees the heavens torn open, spirit coming down like a dove, miracle after miracle after miracle, raising the dead, calming storms. And he still betrayed him. But our behavior always betrays the object of what we behold. So then Jesus gets up and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Of course, uh, foot washing was customary. It was expected. It was a gesture of hospitality that the host extended toward his guests, and it always fell to the lowest member of the household, a Gentile slave. And if there weren't servants in the household, it would fall to a woman or it would fall to a child. I'll tell you who never did it, the master of the house. Mm -mm, not in an honor, shame society. No, 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 no. You avoided shame at all costs. Gerald Borcher, to theologian, writes, students were responsible to rabbis or teachers to perform menial tasks of labor, but touching feet was clearly not expected. In a society that was very conscious of status symbols of shame and honor, the touching or washing of feet was an extremely important matter. Nowhere in the gospel account, nowhere in the account of this nar uh, narrative or anywhere in the gospels do we read of the disciples washing Jesus' feet. In fact, Borchard also writes that nowhere in all of his research, in all of his research, could he find even one example of a leader washing an inferior's feet. Foot washing is mentioned several times in the Old Testament, three if I'm recalling correctly. Uh, one incident of note is Genesis 18.4 when the Lord visited Abraham. And you remember the scene. Uh, it says the Lord uh, visited Abraham and Abraham looks up and he sees three visitors walking toward him and he bows down low and he says, let a little water be brought so that you may all wash your feet. He didn't say, so I'll wash your feet. What Jesus did was extraordinary. It was absolutely extraordinary. He went as low as he could possibly go. Verse four says that he got up from the table and he took off his outer clothes, clothes, plural, plural. that is ta'amatia, more than one cloak or garment. So this indicates that Jesus took off his cloak and his undergarment and stripped down to a loincloth. Here's a question, why? I mean, I could go around and wash every one of y'all's feet. I, I wouldn't mind, but I will never feel the need to shed a layer. Never. I've taken part in foot washing services before, and I was happy and fully covered the whole time. So why would, I mean, I can understand the outer garment. Why would he strip down to his loincloth? Because Jesus was making a statement. Jesus was making a statement. He took the position, the posture, and the appearance of a slave. Now, I want you to think through with me what this would have looked like. So the disciples were reclining at the table. Jesus would have been in the center. And from what I understand, this meant that they typically lay on their left elbow, okay, and they would reach for food with their right hand. But where would their feet be? Stretched out behind them. They didn't even have to look at the face of the one who washed 
their feet. Verse 5, he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel he had wrapped around himself. Verse 12, so when Jesus had washed their feet and put his outer clothing back on, he took his place at the table again and said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and do so correctly for that is what I am. If I then your Lord and teacher note the reversal, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example you should do just as I have done for you. I tell you the solemn truth. The slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent as a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you understand these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So a lot of us, I would argue all of us, have come to Dallas Theological Seminary because we want a deeper understanding and knowledge of Jesus. We want to wrap our minds around his teachings. We want to understand the theology of what he said. And there are, as we all come to learn there are many things in scripture where very well-respected theologians on both sides simply do not agree. This ain't one of them. This is not one of those teachings. He said, I have given you an example. Do just as I have done. Do what? Serve. Serve. You know, this story is about more than foot washing. It's prophetic. It's symbolic. Jesus laid down his garments, the exact same Greek word used when Jesus laid down his life. Verse 1 said that Jesus loved them to the end. Ace telos. In John 19.30, as he hung on the cross, what did he say? Tetelestai. Same word, different form. It is ended. It is ended. And this is our example, that we would become as servants, that we would lay down our lives for each other and for the glory of Christ. Why? Because every single one of us is ministering on a public stage, and the world is watching, and they are asking us, are you who you say he is? Are you who you say he is? It is no secret that uh, millennials are leaving the church. Um, I keep waiting for the data to change, and it never does. Just in 2019, Barner released a survey that said 59% of people between the ages of 23 and 29 disconnect from the church after the age of 15, either permanently or for an extended reason, uh, season of time. Now, they gave a bunch of examples, but one stood out to me. They value authenticity over just about everything else. And they're not finding it. They're not finding it. Are we who we say he is? Are we? We say he's loving. Are we? To those who don't look like us or talk like us or think like us? We say Jesus gave up his power and his privilege to reach, to reach the lost. Do we? Do we give up power or do we pursue it? Do we set aside privilege or do we seek it? We say he's just. Are we? Are we willing to fight for justice? We say he's kind. Are we? Or are we spending all our spare time on social media jumping into every argument that crosses our feed? He tells us to love our enemies. And he shows us what it looks like. He washed the feet of his betrayer. Will we walk across the aisle and extend a hand of friendship? Be very careful. Be very careful. The call to ministry is not about power. It's not about popularity. It's not about glamour. And it's not about green rooms. The call to ministry is about spending the night in the field with your sheep, wiping their tears, holding their hands, sitting by hospital beds, sharing hope, speaking the truth in love, even 
when it's uncomfortable. But long before anyone will listen to what you say, they will observe the way we behave. And our behavior always betrays the object of our beholding. I started by sharing the story of the Yanomamo people. I would like to end by sharing a story of St. Catherine of Siena that Dr. Sandy Glan shared with me on a wonderful blog post that she wrote on Bible.org. Catherine was born in Siena, Italy in 1347 in the middle of a plague. She was child number 25 to her parents, though half of her brothers and sisters didn't survive childhood, including her twin who died at birth. Catherine was devoted to Jesus her entire life, and in my research, this made me laugh, it says that she was extremely generous and had a habit of giving away her clothes and her possessions and her family's food, and the details were fuzzy on whether or not she asked permission. (laughs) Catherine, as legend goes, had seen a powerful image, uh, vision of Jesus when she was just 21 years old, and in the vision, he told her that she was to help the sick and the poor. When the plague came back with devastating casualties in 1374, Catherine was 27 years old. And anyone who had the means, Dr. Glon writes, uh, to leave the crowded cities fled for the countryside. But Catherine did not. While most of the people rushed out, Catherine and her followers rushed in to care for those who were sick and to bury those who died. Why? Why? Because we become what we behold, and our behavior always betrays the object of our beholding. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the example of St. Catherine of Siena. Thank you for your word, Lord, which is living and active and never stale. We love you, Lord, and we pray that we would be more like you as we behold you in your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.